Welcome to the show. Before we begin, could you give us a quick bio on who you are and what it is that you do? Hi, Kat. Uh, my name is Cédric Bertelli. Uh, I'm the founder of the Emotional Health Institute. Uh, the Emotional Health Institute is a nonprofit organization that um, created a body of work called MRES for Emotional Resolution. And what we do is putting our efforts in understanding how the brain constructs emotional difficulties and how the brain and the body, in a way, can resolve those disruptive um, emotional pattern on a natural um, and simple way. Mm. So why do you feel some emotional difficulties stay with us? Well, you know, I think we are one of the only species with domestic animals and farm animals that um, keep on holding trauma a long time after trauma happens. And uh, one of the main reasons is we're extremely resilient as a species like any other mammals. But one of the main reasons is that we are learning to control our emotions very early on through our parents, through our educations. And we never let the body go through a natural process of, um, I would say, natural emotional resilience. Uh, and what MRS is doing is that allowing a process that never had a chance to to finish, to uh, to go to the end of it, so that these emotions do not stuck, do not stay with us for a long time. I've seen that some animals, when like they're almost killed or something, they'll start shaking. Yeah. And then afterwards, supposedly, it kind of releases a trauma. Did yeah. humans ever do something like that, and we forgot? Well, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's the case. We don't need to shake. Uh, I don't think we we, we, we we do sometimes for a car accident, for example. Uh, there is a, a natural shaking response that should happen. Um, but um, yeah, we have, we have this, it's the exact same capacity. And some of us still do it. Uh, I, often about, I often talk about my grandfather, uh, who was a um, World War II resistant. He never did any kind of psychotherapy, any kind of... Uh, a treatment per se, but after the war, he, he spent a lot of time in nature, working with men, sharing a similar experience. And you know, when you're in nature, with nothing else to do than working and being with people who, who share something similar, when an emotion crosses you or, or is present in you, what do you do? Nothing. A a And so uh, the same, the same um, process that you described about mammals, yes, that's something that should be happening. And that's basically what we allow the body to do. It's a bit more complicated than that, but with MRS, yeah. What are some of the most common emotional difficulties that you see nowadays with people? Oh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of depression. And a lot of this, anger as well, of course, um, lack of self-confidence. A lot of this, what I found is, a lot of this comes from the fact that people have a hard time trusting each other nowadays. And um, it seems like not being able to trust fellow human beings is really increasing um, our lack of emotional health. Is it possible to resolve these emotional difficulties? And why is it not natural for us to figure it out? Um, so um, it's a great question. Number one, it, it is natural. We just don't let the body do it. Uh, number two, yes, it's completely possible. It's completely possible. We do that every day at the Emotional Health Institute. It's is just another view on emotions, right? It's not a Freudian view on emotion, but really um, a pragmatic neuroscientific view on emotion. It is completely, you don't have to carry the weight of trauma, you don't have to carry depression or anxiety for many years. We have the capacity in us to resolve it. It's not magical, it's purely, uh, it's purely neurobiological, like every other species, like every other mammal. And if we've had, let's say, a trauma for decades 
And it's very ingrained in who we are and how we see the world. Is it very difficult to get rid of something that's been with us that long? Is it very difficult? It's not easy for several reasons. The first reason is we've got to we've got to accept thoroughly to let it go, right? A lot of us, we, we create our life around this trauma and letting go of this trauma is not easy because there's a part of us that feel, well, if I let go of this trauma, I, I lose value. I lose, I lose almost the proof of how much I suffered. So we need to be at peace with letting go of the trauma. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing that I would say is it's impossible to heal trauma. Uh, it's a nice formula. People love to say to say it like trauma healing, but guess what? If a trauma happened, it happened. Right? I was raped. If I was uh, uh, beat, uh, I was beat up. Trauma doesn't heal. Trauma happens. All we can do is healing the wounds that trauma created, and that yes can be healed a hundred percent. Now, I've been with that for a long time now, and I I can say that I never met someone who remembers a trauma and that only has one emotion that came out of this trauma. Usually, when we um, experience a trauma, we have different wounds. It can be anxiety. It can be lack of self-confidence, lack of trust, uh, 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 resentment. It can be a bunch of things. But what I would say is, in my view of things, trauma cannot be healed because trauma happened. It needs to be acknowledged, uh, 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 and, and, and that's terrible, but the wounds that were created by trauma can be healed, and we need to take the time to talk with our clients or our patients, patients and understand how the trauma impacted them in their life, all the ways that the trauma impact them in their current life. And the way that we do it with Emras is we're going to take all those wounds that have been created over the years by one or several traumatic events, and we're going to resolve them one after another so that there's much more freedom, much more grace, and, 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 and not as emotional wounds. So let's say someone got into a car accident, like you said, and every time they get in the car, they're freaking out, they're thinking somebody's going to try to hit them, yeah. or they feel out of control. Yeah. What other things could manifest from something like that, that maybe they don't see as very obvious? Yeah. So uh, so all this, everything that you mentioned, yeah, it's it's very classic, and we'll be resolving that, right? We'll be resolving the, the stress, the anxiety, we'll be resolving the, um, the belief that something might happen. Something else is um, their... Um, their self-judgment they might feel like uh, they're not good enough and they're not even able to drive anymore and they might become dependent uh, dependent to their partners or their parents and and feel bad about it they might feel shame for not be able to drive they might feel guilt for not be able to drive so from this problem right of not of not being able to drive because you're too scared then you have all this stuff that comes resentment guilt shame uh, uh, self-confidence uh, so all this all this we, we would need to take the time to to work on them as well do we need to know exactly where emotional pain comes from in order to release it like just say you have a reaction to certain things but you don't know where it came from can you still get rid of it yes absolutely because actually um it's gonna sound weird maybe but we do not remember most of our trauma uh, our um two first years of life, plus anything that happened in utero, uh, is, is um, for most of us, packed with a lot of trauma. We are so vulnerable that anything, you know, uh, too, too, uh, too hot, too cold, too lonely, too, uh, you know, we're so vulnerable that a lot of this can be taken by the brain as trauma because what is a trauma? A trauma is, is an instant that holds too much stress, physical or emotional, for us to take on at the moment that we experience it. So what my two years old might experience as a trauma, uh, I have no idea. It's gonna be very different from what I experienced as a four years old man. So what I mean is to answer your question, I apologize. Um, to answer your question, you don't need to know where the, where the, where the pain comes from. As long 
as you're able to recognize that you're feeling an emotional pain today in your life, as long as you are able to question maybe a, a mood, an emotional, an emotional difficulty, as long as you recognize it today in your life, it can be resolved. You do not need to know. And through MRES, you will not know actually what was the origin of this difficulty. It is not necessary. Your body, your brain holds everything now in your life, right now, to resolve what is not supposed to be there. So, because I know I studied psychology and one of the big things is find out the cause, find out the root of the trauma or whatever. And then when people find it out, they're expecting to have some sort of release and like, oh, that's what it was. Now I'm all better. And that's just never been the case, which is why I just think it's so ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's never the case. I mean, the way that cognitive memory, I will say, and sensorial memory is stored in the brain is very different. So you can understand where a coma comes from. You can be very clear. You might still and you will still uh, carry the wounds of this trauma in you. So with MRS, it's a bit different. With MRS, you will probably not know where the trauma is. I don't put any, we don't put any um, effort in trying to find out, actually, as least as possible. It's not our job. Our job is to resolve the emotional pain. Mm. So this is an interesting question. So I want to know that you sent me. Um, why hope and wishful thinking can sometimes prevent healing? How does that make sense? I know it's, it's, uh, it's counterintuitive. Huh? I would say that People who are not feeling well emotionally, even physically, if they put all their faith in hope, they are putting their faith into something that might never happen. In a way, they're depleting energy, hoping that something will get better. When we want to heal, we want to accumulate energy. And for that, the key to healing is to accept how we are. Not hoping to get better. Sure, we have the intention of getting better, of course. But it's different to have the intention to get better and the hope to get better. If I have the intention to get better, then really what I have to do is to accept the way I am today. Let's say that I have chronic fatigue or depression or anger issues. Yeah, I, 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 I accept it. I mean that I don't judge it. Accepting it doesn't mean that I like it, but I accept the way it is today. When I accept, I can adapt. I can stop telling stories about how I hope we get, I hope to, I hope it's gonna get better. I can stop telling story about how I wish I could be. I can stop telling myself story about how I am. No, accepting how we are. Again, doesn't mean that we like it. When we fully accept how we are, then we adapt, we become intimate with it. We stop running away from it. We stop hiding it. We stop fighting it. We adapt. And then from this place, we can act with force and power. When we accept how we feel, we accumulate force. We accumulate energy. We stop telling ourselves and other stories. And from this place, we're gonna move and heal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, I express myself well. Yes. Um, let's say somebody has a lot of anger issues towards a particular person. Do you yeah. think that forgiving that person can also help someone relieve trauma? Or is that not a vital part of relieving the trauma? So um, I know very well that, that, that there is a, a culture of forbidding, right? You got to not for, for um, forgiving, right? You've got to forgive your aggressor. Like if I'm being raped, I have to forgive the person who did it. If I was beat up as a kid, I've got to forgive the person who, who, who beat me up. So I know it's a bit countercurrent, but I would say that, at least in my book, right, and it's only a personal opinion, a personal opinion that I built after working with a lot of people with trauma. For me, it's not necessary to forgive. 
what's necessary is to resolve the emotional difficulties that we that we have and to live on so i think there's a difference between not holding resentment and forgive right there's a if you if you hold resentment then yes the person keep on harassing you for the rest of your life no the key for me is to not hold resentment to heal whatever can be healed in our life so we feel free from the trauma but i mean if forgiving happened wonderful but i don't think it's necessary to put any effort in forgiving you know it sounds strange but i had a lot of clients that reach a great level of healing and what was left is they were mad at themselves because they were not able to forgive their uh, aggressor and I often tell them you don't need to forgive them you need to live on it's not about moving on no it's about living on with a resentment but also knowing that well you don't actually need to forgive at least it's my view of things why do some people seem to be very attached to emotional pain and maybe they don't want to as other people would want to get rid of it as much as others that they kind of identify with it because we are complex beings human beings and um we attach a lot of value in our suffering rightfully so right because we're going through a lot sometimes and we attach a lot of value to the pain that we're still feeling it's a bit like if we resolve the pain that we've been feeling for years today if we resolve the pain that we've been feeling because of a trauma or a pain that we don't know where is where is there it's about like if i resolve it then all this pain that i've been feeling lose is weight like everything i suffered about no one will know anymore and i suffered for nothing um it's not the case of course people never know how much we suffer anyway it's a phrase really personal um, and, and another reason is if um if i have depression or ptsd for most of my life people are going to act toward me a certain way maybe they're going to be more careful about me they're going to care about me maybe a bit more they will be more attentionate and there is sometimes a fear that if i heal if i get better people will not care for me as much as they have to as they have been so these are just few reason why and uh, and for some other people is just unthinkable that they can be better you know uh, people who often are people who remember the trauma and 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 it's not even the idea that they might feel better is not even approachable to them so they need to already shift this paradigm that yeah there's a matter how much i suffered at some point in my life it doesn't really matter how much i suffer today things can actually shift and i can feel better i do not have to carry this weight mm. What inspired you to develop MRES? Um so first of all I got to say MRES is something that we develop as a team uh, you know I'm not alone developing MRES with Dr. Jacques Fumex uh, and other um, other uh, people from the Emotional Health Institute it's a teamwork um I guess um few things number one, I was dealing with a lot of uh emotional difficulties like of like often you know when we go into a line of work often is because uh, we are uh, directly concerned by it um so i was dealing with a lot of anxiety and self directed anger and i wanted to to find a way to get better that didn't involve years and years of therapy which i did uh, by the way before 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 emres does that and another another thing that um really pushed me toward emres was before this career i was working for the ritz carlton hotels and i was a director of restaurants so i was I had the opportunity to manage a lot of stuff a lot of employees and you can see that when you manage employees you do not manage employees you manage the emotions 
And in order for them to thrive in their work, you need to think about with who they're going to work, what kind of task will make them happy. So I, during my whole career in hospitality business, I was fascinated on how emotions rule the workplace. Uh, so I, I took a, a liking in understanding emotion and trying to, uh, how can I say, do a little alchemy with them so that people are as happy as they can in the workplace. And another thing that pushed me toward Emrest uh, is my grandfather, as I said earlier. I was fascinated how people from his generations who went through World War II were able to be as resilient as they were. I noticed when I came to the U.S. specifically how people who come from uh, the front, the army front, are suffering for a long time from PTSD and sometimes never recover. However, because I come from a small village in France, I had the opportunity to be a lot around my grandfather's father and uh, other men that uh, were fighting in World War II. And the way they came out of it was so different from soldier nowadays. And so watching him, being around him, he's still alive, he's 100 now, and he's sharp as a whistle. Um, watching him, I, I understood that some things can happen that allow the body and the brain to become very resilient. And what was it? I think I said that earlier, if I repeat myself, is it is that when they came from war, first of all, they had a goal, they had to provide for their family. So it, it was, there's, no, no, there's no, no other choice. They had to be committed to provide for the family. Number two, my grandfather and the people that I know from this generation worked outside in nature. Number three, they were together. People who share a similar experiences, but they never talked about war. Never, ever. You know, even, even later on, I remember uh, old, uh, specifically men, coming to my grandfather, and sometimes uh, during the conversation, one of them would say three words. Do you remember? That's it. And they would not talk about what they were remembering. They just, do you remember? And the other one said, yeah, and that's it. And there was a silence. And there was a communion almost. All those moments, the nature, the, 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 the dedication to work, the, the common experience shared in a common environment, I think that allows the body to be extremely resilient. And um, so anyway, that's a long answer to say, yes, I had different, different avenues that pushed me toward this work. And I am so happy that we were able to develop a work and, and help people resolve even old, or deep wounds. Yeah. So that made me think about this generation and how they're so isolated and online so much of the time and they're sharing their traumas to an audience for likes and shares and social media clout. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with, in your opinion, the rise in everybody's collective traumas. Yeah, it doesn't help. It definitely doesn't help. It's, I mean, as you said, right, it's, you share your trauma and that part is great. You know, sharing what we, sharing what we live, it's great. But the way it is, the way it's received and maybe the, the goal for it, it might not be the best all the time. So yes, our current environment and society is not um, supporting trauma, trauma healing um, and, our, and our emotional health as a whole, I would say. Mm. Uh, yes. we're, missing, we're missing connection. We're missing connection, we're missing nature. We're looking for solution outside when they're inside. You know, we distract ourselves so much with <clears throat> with social media, with gaming, with porn, with Netflix, with you, you name it. We have so much opportunity 
to distract ourselves. And some of those opportunities might even feel uh, healthy, right? Like uh, even uh, feel good apps or stuff like that. It's in order to resolve a disruptive emotional difficulty, you have to dive into it. You have to feel it completely and, and with that type, without any kind of control or distraction. And um, as you said, Kat, uh, uh, the current society do not um, bring us to this place very often. Yeah, one thing I heard was that Gen Z started a trend on the internet called silent walking where they walk without electronics, music, or any distractions. They just figured that out. And that is just so sad. So sad. And, and also, it's, it's, in a way, it's wonderful that they're doing that, right? It's wonderful that, um, that they, they, they realize that a lot of things that are provided out there is not uh, leading to healing and that they decide to get together and just and just walk without any kind of uh, electronic i know it sounds right but um i'm glad they're doing it i'm glad they're doing it yes and yeah. there's the the no porn movement that's going on with guys because a lot of them are finding they have lots of dysfunctions afterwards Porn is an epidemic. Uh, I have a lot of men that come to me for porn addiction. Mm. Porn is everywhere. I mean, everywhere, but meaning it's accessible mm -hmm. for free at any time. It's uh, instant gratification. It's everything. It's everything you want, right? It's everything you want. So it's very easy to be addicted, but in that, with that come shame, guilt. Uh, feeling out of integrity with your partner, being uh, having um, judgment toward yourself, yeah, and it's difficult to let go because it's so accessible. Mm, I heard the average age now that they start is ten, because Crazy. everybody has a phone now. It's 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 terrible. I mean, I mean the 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 the, the wounding that that creates in the psyche. In the intimacy, you know, in, in it's, you know, in the same way that alcohol can be found and consumed and it's just fine, right? When actually it's destroying life, maybe much more than other drugs. Porn is a, is a bit the same way, except you can access it at 10 easily instead of 21 or 18. You know, the damage, the damage done to men, but also male, but also female, I mean, everybody, right? Because everybody is going to, is going to, is going to feel the repercussion of that is greater than we can imagine, I think. Yeah. I mean, and I've seen it in when I've talked to people about the dating crisis going on, most men are single now. They can't connect with another person. They're addicted to that. They just stay home and do that. They don't have the motivation to go out and find a girlfriend. Yeah. I believe it. I believe it. And it takes a lot of will to decide to, to stop that pattern, right? And to, to decide to move out of this porn vortex and back into, quote unquote, real intimacy, real connection. And also, we've got to ask ourselves, why are we so attracted to that? Why are we so attracted to porn? What are we lacking in our life that porn is actually coming to fill up? What is it that I'm getting when I'm watching porn that I don't get from life? Hmm? Could you provide an overview of the MRES? process and how it differs from maybe a traditional approaches to healing trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, MRES has been crafted on the understanding on how brain construct emotion, um, mostly based on the work of Antonio Damasio 
Eliza Feldman Barrett, but other neuroscientists as well. Today we understand how a brain constructs disruptive emotional pattern. We know that at the origin of every one of our disruptive emotional pattern is always the same type of event. And it's an event that we're going to define as a trauma. Again, a trauma is all it is, is only an instant that holds too much stress for us to take on at the instant when we live it. We understand that when there is a trauma, an instant of trauma, depending on how old we are, but to keep it simple, we're gonna say that when there is trauma, there is an instant of dissociation. So what does that mean? That means that uh, right now, you and I, as we speak, our brain, as I will speak, our brain um, um, is able to capture about 2,000 bits of information per second, consciously. Now, consciously, what we are, what we are uh, gathering is about 2,000 bits of information per second. Consciously, we're processing those 2,000 bits of information at a speed of 150 miles per hour. That's the conscious. Simultaneously, our subconscious has the potential to gather about 400 billion bit of information per second, opposite to 2,000, and to process this information at a speed of 150,000 miles per hour versus 150 miles per hour. So when we live an instant, when we experience an instant of trauma, our cognitive, so to speak, our conscious shut down. Why? So that we don't suffer too much during the trauma. But when the cognitive shut down, our subconscious is wide open. One of the main roles of the, of the prefrontal cortex, cortex is to be used as a filter, to filter this information so we can have this conversation, you know, so we can live in our life. But during dissociation, the conscious is shutting down. So now the subconscious is like a huge sponge gathering all the informations happening during this instant of trauma. So when I say information, what is it? What I smell, what I taste, what I feel, basically everything available through the five senses. Subconscious is also going to gather the information present in the body, basically what physical sensations I'm feeling in my body during this instant of trauma. But keep in mind that all these informations are non-logical. It's like a vortex open, gathering, gathering all this, all this data on a non-logical, non-linear way and trapping it in the brain and in the body. Later on, when our body is um, exposed to one of the elements, one or several of the elements that were present one way or another, under one form or another, during one of our tick event, our brain is going to predict instantly what physical sensations we are about to feel based on what was felt during a specific traumatic event. We've got to know that one of the main job of the brain is to predict. The brain is constantly predicting. We can see that with food, for example, you know, if one day you have a Granny Smith apple, the first Granny Smith apple of your life, when you have the first one, you have an, a, a sensorial experience, the acidity, the crunch, the juice, very well. But the next time, and for the rest of your life, every time you're gonna take a granny piece apple, right before you buy this apple, you're already going to know the experience that you're about to have. Your brain predicting the experience you have before biting. Do you, can you relate to that? Yes. Yeah. And so, and so it's the same thing with emotions. A disruptive emotional pattern is an outdated prediction from the brain. So to answer your question a bit further, when the body is exposed to a stimulus, being a smell, a situation, uh, something that you view somewhat, there is a stimulus in your current environment that, rem you, that remind your brain of something that was present during one of your past trauma. 
your brain is going to generate the physical sensations that you're about to feel. These physical sensations have a name. We call that interoception. These physical sensations is what lets you know that you are feeling an emotion. You know that you're feeling anxious or angry or afraid because you're feeling sensations in your body, because you're feeling interoception. These physical sensations is an outdated prediction from the brain. So what do we do usually when we feel an emotion? A few things. Either way, we shut it down. Number two, we control it. So we take some deep breath, we have a glass of wine, a glass of water, we go meditate, we control, so we stop feeling that way. Number three, we're trying to control our environment so that this emotion is being shut down as soon as possible. Anyway, every time we feel a disruptive emotional pattern, what do we do? We control ourselves, our environment, it doesn't matter. But you see, the problem is we never let this prediction playing out until we down. Every time we shut down this sensory or prediction, we're reinforcing the message to the brain that we're about to face a danger. Now, to resolve a disruptive emotional pattern, all we've got to do, and I know it sounds simplistic, but I'm sorry to say, is the truth. In order to resolve a disruptive emotional pattern, all we've got to do is to let this sensorial prediction, the sensations inside of us, playing out inside of us without any interference. We need to let these physical sensations change in our body without trying to control what we feel, without trying to understand what we feel, without trying to control our environment. If we let our sensorial, our sensations, change in our body during an emotion in a safe environment until that dawn changing in our body. At the end of the prediction, our brain is anticipating to be hit with some kind of danger. That's what it's predicting. Well, if you let the prediction plays out until the end, at the end of the prediction, nothing happens. You're safe and sound. From that very instant, your prediction will be updated forever until proven wrong. What does that mean? That means that when you let the sensation play out in your body without trying to take a breath, without, when you let the sensation play out in your body until that dawn changing in your body, at the end of the prediction, nothing happens to you. From that very instant, the prediction is updated. From the very instant, this emotion will not come back in your life anymore. One more, one more uh, piece of information is that when we let the prediction play out until the end, this take, letting the prediction play until the end, takes between 2 seconds and 90 seconds maximum. So yes, the physical discomfort can be a bit uncomfortable at times, but it's not going to hurt us. It's only traces of things that we already lived at some point in our life. It's only sensations. They might be uncomfortable, but they're safe. Did I answer your question? Yes, but I have another. So, <laughs> so okay, for an example, let's yeah. say... Um, let's say someone was cheated on yeah. and they're always anxious when their new partner, like, let's say hides their cell phone or whatever. Yeah. And they want to be like, why did you do that? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Even though there's no real threat, there's no real reason for that, but they have that from the past trauma. Yep. Yeah. So what you're saying is maybe it's better to just feel that and then just ignore it, let it pass, and then realize that it was just no big deal? And you were just creating things in your mind or something? So, <clears throat> the goal of MRS is to resolve emotional difficulties that are not congruent with our reality. Right? Because we're always going to feel emotions. We're human beings. 
But the problem is that our suffering comes from emotions that are not congruent with our current reality. If I've been shitted on, that's a fact. And it happened. Now, uh, my partner right now might not be cheating on me. So all the jealousy, all the, the doubt, all the... Uh, it's not congruent with my current reality. It comes from something that happened to me, so I understand why, but it's not congruent. And maybe I make my partner's life miserable and am I actually messed up my healthy couple now because of some fear. So if I feel jealous or worried or resolve, resolve, because these emotions anyway are blinding you from whatever reality is happening in your life right now. And <clears throat> if I resolve my fear of being cheated on again, does that mean I'm going to be an idiot and not learn from my past experience? No. I still and even more will be able to learn from my past experience. <clears throat> and if <clears throat> I resolve my fear and I don't have tension in my body and I tell my partner, hey, you know, you know what happened to me in the past? Do you mind if you don't hide your phone when I come around? Or if I'm able to address my concern without any tension, my partner will be much more receptive to what I'm saying compared that if I come to her with tension and almost accusation. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's not about being an idiot. And, and not uh, learning from past experience. But often our fear do not let us integrate our past experience and make us react. So we don't see the reality of things. So we don't, we're missing, up, we're missing out the opportunity to actually be happy. We're a fantastic, great person because a past relationship screws us up, so to speak. So, sorry, it's a bit of a long answer, but resolve your emotional difficulties, resolve your anxiety, and if you need your partner to be supportive of you as you heal from a past experience of cheating, for example, if you approach him or her with uh, no tension, then you can work together toward it. And, and, and you can see, live, experience what is actually happening today in your life and stop suffering from a painful past experience. And so let's say, um, here's an example. I know two people that went through the same traumatic near death experience and one of them is traumatized. The other one thinks it was exhilarating, exciting. And look what I, uh, like live through. How can two people experience the same trauma and react so differently? And how can we learn to become the one who was like, Oh, that was great. I, I lived through that. <laughs> um, I think there's two main reasons for the, the, the difference here. Number one, what they experienced in their past. I guarantee you that the person that remained traumatized <clears throat> in their life, very early on maybe, already experienced a trauma. <clears throat> and sorry, I'm, be, I'm a little sick. I apologize for, for the gravity voice. Um, already experienced a trauma. And the second event that traumatized him <coughs> or, or actually is actually sorry <coughs> apologize is actually um, mirroring something that happened in the past so the first trauma might have been forgotten but the second event that you just mentioning is activating something that was already in him so the, the, the initial trauma happened a long time ago maybe and what just happened to that person reactivate it and now the trauma is active first reason why second reason why is the environment after the event that you mentioned if my ev environment after a, a traumatic experience or an intense experience is supportive loving i can talk about it i'm not judged i'm being taken care of by my environment whatever i lived will be resolved much more, integrated much more. We talked about my grandfather earlier. Resilience will happen. Resilience happens most of the time when our environment 
is loving and supportive and I can talk about what happened to me. So uh, two reasons, uh, three, well, two reasons, two main reasons. Number one, the person that remained traumatized, I guarantee you that something happened before that he or she might not remember, but that actually was reactivated by that event. Number two, the, <clears throat> the importance of environment after a traumatic event. If it's supportive, if there is nature, if it's loving, and if I can speak about it, speak about what I felt, speak about what I feel, then I will not stay, quote unquote, traumatized. Okay, so like, let me see if I got this right. An example would be, let's say there was two friends somewhere at like a hotel and they had a hotel invasion and armed people came in and held them up at gunpoint and stole their stuff. Mm -hmm. One of them can't sleep at night. The other one, maybe nothing traumatizing happened when they were a kid and they go to a barbecue the next day with friends and family and everybody's like, oh, what happened? Tell us, oh, that's so interesting. Oh, wow, I, I can't believe you survived. Good job, man, whatever. So that would be a non-traumatized event. And the other one who just went home alone to an apartment and just watched Netflix and then heard noises would probably continue the trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if something happened to them earlier in their life. Mm -hmm. Again, they don't need to know what it is. It might be even something that happened in utero, right? It might be, I mean, who knows? But if something happened to them earlier that was traumatizing, that they remember or not, and they didn't have the proper support after that event, chances are they will carry the trauma or the emotional pain for a while. And of course, there's also personality, right? We all have different personalities. And that plays out as well. Yes. So would you say that making sure children don't go through any trauma, at least in the first couple years of life, when you as a parent have control of it, is setting them up for the best chance of not having traumatic uh, responses to things in the future? A hundred and ten percent. And and also, um, I, don't, I, I don't know if you're a parent yourself. Yes. Yeah. So you know that it's impossible for us to prevent to prevent trauma for them. You know, we wish we could. We're gonna do our very best, you know, but it's impossible. I mean, uh, um, just the birth process, right? I mean, coming out of the womb, uh, it's, it's it's traumatic. Is you know, the temperature difference, the noise, uh, the shots, the, all this, you know, so much happened during just the first hours after this little being is out of the womb, you know? So there is so much. So to answer your question, yes, you're absolutely right. And we cannot prevent. Uh, their life is their life. All we can do as parents is providing the most loving and, yeah, safe environment as we can. Because even if stuff happens in their life, if the environment around them is loving and they can actually feel safe in our presence and in our home, a lot of the things they're going through in their life will resolve by themselves. The importance of the environment during of our children during the first two years of their life is absolutely key to their emotional health later on. Does that mean that we have to be wealthy? No. I mean, I don't come from a wealthy family at all, but I feel safe at home. You know, it has nothing to do with money, you know. Well, yes, of course, you need to have food on your table. That, yes, you need to be properly fed, and that's not a granted for everybody. But the environment is absolutely, absolutely decisive in our emotional health. The environment when we're children, and, and then later on as well, of course, but, but when we're children during the first two years of life, the first four years of life, I would say even, yeah. And the environment of the mother while she's pregnant, right? So as a partner, our job is, uh, among other things, but to provide a nurturing and safe environment for our partner while she's holding life. 
it is extremely clean as well. So it doesn't start when the baby is out. It starts before, when the baby is in the womb. So the environment for the mother is extremely important as well. Yes, I 100% believe that. And I would tell my husband before I got pregnant, when I'm pregnant, do not let me get upset. Do not let me get stressed. You have to handle everything. And if you see me get stressed, you have to deal with it immediately so that nothing happens to the baby's nervous system. That's correct. Very, very strict on that. Yep. And I think you're completely right. Your nervous system as the mom has to be nurtured and protected as well. And so so the baby is, uh, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. And I was lucky I got to stay home when I was pregnant. And I had friends that they had to work and stressful jobs, running around, doing everything. And their kids came out totally different. You could you could see it in their nervous systems, how hyperreactive they were to any sort of stress. Yeah, absolutely. And isn't it uh, funny how society is, right? How our pregnant women have to work until, I mean, a week, two weeks before giving birth. And uh, if there are kids at home already, uh, uh, feeding the other, I mean, it, it, it's just, it, I mean, if you think about it for a second, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah, 100% against women working while pregnant and even the first few years of life. I think it should be very relaxing, just alone with the baby in a quiet space, go for strolls. I don't feel like you should be running to work and, and in traffic and putting kids in daycare and things like that. I mean, I know we all can't, have, we don't all have that choice, but ideally, I think that's the best. Yeah, society, uh, the way society is, at least in the West, I don't know about the other countries, right? But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough to, to take care of um, ourselves. Are there any maybe prerequisites or limitations for individuals when they seek MRES therapy? No, no, no prerequisite. Uh, the only prerequisite is they need to want to get better. The intention for the client is key, right? Uh, if they come because uh, uh, their wife, their parents, their husband send them to us, it's not going to work because they need to be involved. Right, they need to be involved in the process. Uh, uh, as as a practitioner, as an MRS practitioner, I, I cannot fix you. It, it doesn't exist. It comes from within. I can just create the environment. I can just make things happen. So so that you take control of your own healing. For that, you need to you need to be willing and involved. So. Uh, the requirement is you want to get better. You want to feel better. And you're willing to uh, to do the work, so to speak. That's the only requirement. Mm -hmm. And if uh, when parents send me their kids, I always tell parents, uh, yes, of course, I'm going to see your child. And I will only work on what your child wants to work on. So I hear what the parents want, wants, working on anxiety or anger. But my question will be to the child, if I could help you, let's say that you have a magical power and you actually have the power to stop something that makes you suffer inside. What would you like to stop feeling? And based on what the child is saying, we're going to focus on that, not on what the parents want. And very often, by working on what the kid wants, whatever the parents was interested in, in resolving, will resolve as well. Or... If we resolve something and the kids really wanted to get resolved, then they open up to the idea of, yeah, mom or dad want me to work on that. Okay, I can try. Anyway, it's to go back to what I said earlier, which is um, what's important is our intention, our own intention, even if we're very young. And how long does a typical uh, therapy time work? So that depends on what the client wants to work on, right? Uh, uh, if a client comes to work on a phobia, for example, often one or two sessions is enough. Uh, if a client comes to see us on a life dynamic that involves a lot of different emotions to resolve, then you might need uh, two, three, four sessions. But during one appointment, 
we're going to resolve several different emotions. People come to see us for fear or an anger or an anxiety. We will aim to resolve whatever they want to, plus uh, all those parasites emotions, such as uh, the guilt that uh, this emotion created or the shame or the resentment or uh, 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 the self-hatred. So within one appointment, we're going to aim to resolve several emotions. And after an appointment, we, uh, we ask the client, how long do you need in order to notice the impact of the work that we've done today? And the client will tell us, well, I will know in a week or in two weeks or in a month if I feel different. Perfect. Then we take an appointment for checking in and we see how the client is. Very often, everything is resolved. Sometimes some things, you know, came up or, or still feel a little crunchy. Then we will resolve that during the check-in. So uh, it depends what the client wants to work on. It depends how many emotions the, the, the client wants to work on as well. But uh, uh, for us, our goal is to try to be as efficient as we can. Can someone who's on, let's say, anti-anxiety medications or things like that to deal with stress and trauma, can they still do the treatment? Or do you recommend that they wean off any pharmaceuticals? Uh, um, a short answer will be as long as the client still feels some kind of form of the anxiety or the depression, then we can work on it. Hmm. If it's completely numbed by the medicine, then it's not accessible for us. And I will not ask them to stop the medicine or two. Uh, um, but if the medicine numb completely, first of all, I don't think it's healthy. Um, and that would be more difficult for us to resolve it. E except if they just got into the into medication in the last few months and they still clearly remember moment of past anxieties or past depression, they would be able to access. But if they're under medication for years, for example, and it's it completely numbed the symptom, then it would be difficult for us to access. Mm. So let me see one more. Where can everyone go to learn more on MRES therapy? Um, so uh, can I say something? I'm sorry. It's because I, 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 it's about the word therapy. Um, um, it's MRES is a body of work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like to, I don't like to call it a therapy um, um, because the client is, is really put at the center of the healing, so to speak. And um, us as practitioner, we, yeah, we have a whole body of work, it's extensive, but really our goal is to, to uh, put the client in control so that the resolution happen as quick as we can. It's just, it's just semantic. Uh, uh, to learn about it, you can go to emres.com, E-M-R-E-S.com, or uh, emotionalhealthinstitute.org, it goes to the same place. Uh, and my personal website is cedricbertelli.com. So you will have, uh, on, on emres.com, you will have a lot of different information about the science behind the work, uh, interviews, articles, uh, everything you can wish for. And which social media platforms are you guys most active on? Um, I would say we're most active on Facebook and Instagram. LinkedIn a little bit as well, but uh, mostly Facebook and Instagram. Perfect. So I'll put all of that in the show notes so everyone can check that out. And okay. is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with before we go? Yes. Oh, or YouTube as well. We have a cool YouTube channel with a uh, snippet and, and stuff uh, and things like that. Um, yes. Um, even if you carry or even if you've been carrying an emotional difficulties for a very long time, you don't have to keep on carrying it. Even if you know what created this difficulty and it's horrible, you have to carry the weight of trauma. And if you don't know why you feel a certain way, it doesn't really matter. Um, what I will say is try to do this if you want to have a taste of what MRS is, if you want to have a taste of what your body is capable of. Next time you will feel an emotional difficulty, 
anxiety, stress, frustration, doesn't matter what. Next time you feel an emotion that you don't want to feel anymore, try to do that. As soon as you notice it, close your eyes and make sure you feel comfortable to close your eyes. You, you, cannot, uh, you cannot be in a situation where you want to peek or, or feel bad about closing your eyes. It's very important that you're able to close your eyes. It shows on your body, feel safe. If you want to peek or if you feel bad, it's because your body doesn't feel safe. So it's important that when you feel this emotion, you want to resolve it. To you close your eyes and you feel completely fine closing your eyes. Once you close your eyes, pay attention to two sensations in your body, two physical sensations. Maybe your throat is tight, your heart is beating, tension in your back. Pay attention to two physical sensations at once. And after that, Remain attentive to what's happening in your body. So do not let your mind wander. Do not try to think about what happened. No, no, no. Actively feel the sensations in your body. You will notice that the sensations are going to change in the body. They might become a little bit uncomfortable. It's okay. Keep on actively feeling. Keep your attention sharp, intense, in feeling what's happening in your body. The sensations are going to change. They're going to change for two seconds to 90 seconds maximum. Sometimes they can be quite uncomfortable. Do not panic. Just be with it. At the end of the change, you're going to feel a sense of calm. Open your eyes. And from that, notice if this emotion comes back or not. That's all you got to do. So it's simple. But you got to be willing to do it. And remember that if you feel uncomfortable and you're taking some deep breath or stretching, or it's counterproductive. It's important to be with the sensations, to feel the sensations actively until the sensations abate by themselves. So just try and let us know what you find. Thank you so much for your time today. And that was wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you, Kat. And have a wonderful day. Thank you.